Um, and thank you, Ashanta, for accepting the invitation of the Sri Lanka Literary Society to give this lecture today via Zoom. Um, so just to give you an introduction um, to Ashanta and his life so far, Ashanta uh, was awarded a PhD recently in ethnomusicology from the University of British Columbia in Canada for his doctoral research on the historical processes of changes in a Sri Lankan ritual drumming tradition. He also runs an online discussion group through the Center for the Study of Sri Lankan Performing Arts, uh, which connects people globally, and I am a regular attendee of that forum. So Ashanta is also the managing editor for an academic journal called Analytical Approaches to World Music. So Ashanta, uh, what are your musical interests? Can you please tell us? Oh, yes, thanks for asking. So my background as a musician is in Western classical music. Um, but growing up, I was also exposed to jazz and various forms of popular musics. Um, of the last, as of the last 10 years or so, I've been interested in traditional musics in Sri Lanka, and by extension, traditional musics from all over the world. Um, so I'm interested in a variety of different musics. And as a performer, I'm interested in using these insights that I gain from my study of musics to using those insights to inform my performances. All right, thank you. <clears throat> and how has this uh, approach influenced your work, the approach that you're taking to studying music? Uh, I think by studying the cultural context and historical background of these different musics, <clears throat> I'm able to bring different insights. I'm, uh, as I said, I'm trained as a Western classical pianist. I've also worked with the Symphony Orchestra of Sri Lanka, and I've worked with different ensembles in Sri Lanka. Um, for example, the groups Balifonics and Triloka. Yes. And have you recorded any of your own compositions and also your performances? Um, I have a album of solo piano music that I recorded maybe about eight years ago. Um, that features um, compositions from composers all around the world. Um, I've also recorded a couple of albums with the flutist Selina Charlier. Um, oh yeah, I've recorded a couple of albums with the rock band Triloka, but again, more than 10 years ago now. All right. And um, you're also a music educator, which is an uh, interesting angle uh, to a musician's life. And you are the co-founder of Music Matters in Sri Lanka, in Colombo. Can you tell us a bit more of your teaching activities um, in the various sectors in the world? Uh, yes, of course. Um, so Music Matters is um, something that I founded um, more than 10 years ago with one of my colleagues, Sumudhi Suravira, in Colombo. So Music Matters is still running. Um, I'm currently in Canada, as mentioned. Um, since I came to Canada, I did my PhD. I've also taught at the University of British Columbia and online at the University of Peradeniya, uh, mostly related to dance history and world music cultures. Yes. And uh, what are your main musical interests and research interests? Um, so my research interests on one hand are focused on music of South Asia. On the other hand, I'm sort of interested broadly in um, analyzing the sound of musics from all over the world. Okay, thank you. So now what remains for you, Ashanta, is to uncover the musical histories for us. So it's over to you now to start. Yeah, thank you. Let me just... So I'm not running a stopwatch, but... I, ha I can see the time, so just let me know if it's getting close to okay. 45 minutes and I'm not done with it. All right, that's fine. I trust you can see my screen here, uncovering musical histories in South Asia, case studies from Sri Lanka and beyond. Yes, I um, can see. Great, thank you once again for having me here today. Um, as a scholar, as mentioned, I have researched the history of Candian drumming. 
I assume that many of you are familiar with Kandyan drumming from the Kandy Perahara and from Sinhalese weddings. Um, broadly speaking, my research has looked at how drumming used to sound in its original context, which is the Gomba Kankaria ritual, um, in comparison with how it is often used today as a political symbol of national pride. Um, so just as a refresher, here's a video that I took from a ritual, so you can hear what ritual drumming sounds like. <laughs> And then for comparison, here's the way that people in Sri Lanka often hear this music used. In addition to weddings, it's often used as a political symbol. Um, you will all know what this is. Presumably that sounds familiar to many of you. Um, anyway, today I'm going to be talking a bit about Kandyan traditional musics, but considering in particular what connections these musics may have to other musics in South Asia. Um, I know that you are officially a literary society, but I'm hoping that I can convince you today that oral traditions, which are not necessarily written down, can still be taken seriously as cultural texts which can be examined for aesthetic and historical value. I'll explain what I mean in a bit. Um, in the past, in some parts of the world, people wrote down the notes of their music, um, presumably and probably to jog their memory about music that they already knew well. Um, so here are some examples of historical notation from around the world that have still been preserved to this day. Of course, none of these musical traditions have been performed continuously from then up to now. So we have to make a lot of guesses as to how these written notes are going to be interpreted if we want to recreate this music in performance. Um, so just a bit of context. Here are these old scores interpreted by some contemporary performers. So this is the earliest known notation of um, multi-part polyphonic music from Europe. Sancte Polifati Matir Inclite Christi. Here's another example. This is music from 7th century China, interpreted by a contemporary performer. We should also remember that these written musical notations come from elite scribes who had the time and resources to actually write them down. Um, what this means is that we still know nothing about the sound of other musical traditions from the same period that weren't written down, for example, folk music. And what I'm trying to say is that the musical histories that we know from these eras and locations is incomplete. In other parts of the ancient world, educated people described the music that they heard or maybe they describe the music that they wanted to hear. And these descriptions, such as those found in the 2000-year-old Natya Shastra, were passed down and debated in oral traditions for centuries across South Asia before they were written down in medieval times. Um, so most of the manuscripts that we find today are medieval times, written down oral traditions that are much older. 
Um, a handful of these oral traditions are still being passed down, uh, probably with very little change. Um, in this example of chanting the Vedas in South India, um, you can see the importance placed on accurate reproduction of these sacred texts. So again, this is just some background information on oral traditions. More than 3,000 years ago, nomads entered India. They spoke an Indo-European language called Vedic. They composed the four Vedas, which later Hinduism regarded as a sacred revelation. The oldest of these is the Rig Veda. Unlike the Bible, which means literally the book, the Vedas were handed down without writing, word for word, from father to son, from teacher to pupil. So you can see how it's it might actually be possible for the same music to be and text to be transmitted very accurately for 3000 years. Um, anyway, moving on. So, um, so unlike this example of Vedic chanting, however, most of the musical traditions documented in ancient texts have not been performed continuously from them until now. Um, so we can only creatively imagine what these historical musics might have sounded like. And here too, we're looking at elite discussions of elite musics, the so-called great traditions, um, which doesn't tell us much about the music that was being performed in the thousands of diverse villages across South Asia, um, the so-called little traditions. Um, of course, we South Asians like to seek validation in antiquity. And so what that means is it's common today to see people of high social standing borrow living art forms from people of lower social standing, um, but then simply cite the ancient Natya Shastra as the source of their art. As mentioned today, the focus, my focus today is on a few types of music associated with the upcountry or the Udarata tradition of central Sri Lanka. Um, as you may know, this tradition has roots in the rituals performed by Sinhalese hereditary ritualists from the central mountainous region of the country, um, which surrounded the historical kingdom of Kandy. Given the lack of historical documentation or archaeological evidence about this village-based tradition, um, I employ a variety of alternative approaches to uncovering the likely histories of these musics, um, paying particular attention to processes of change and continuity. My interpretations are informed by scholarly methods that attempt to understand cultural traditions on their own terms, and also by theories that draw attention to the motivations between, behind particular historical narratives. Um, the histories that I propose today uh, will contrast with conventional narratives that portray musical styles as having developed in isolation um, within particular ethnic groups, and instead I hint at a long history of cultural interaction and sharing. Um, I draw attention to deep-rooted musical similarities between different traditions in South Asia, and I hope to suggest that the social divisions that we uphold today, um, for example, based on ethnic identity, geographic boundaries, religious affiliations, language differences, and hierarchies of caste, class, and gender, are likely to be divisions that we have imposed recently. Um, I'm not trying to suggest that the past was a better place for people, or that people in the past did not oppress each other. Um, I'm also not trying to deny that cultural traditions have developed in unique social contexts, um, but I do like to question whether we still have valid historical reasons to keep separating people the way that we do today. Uh, moving on to the music. Um, so the American musicologist Richard Wolff, um, he's spent many years traveling and living in South Asia, studying a variety of musics, including classical musics, folk musics, and tribal traditions from different countries. 
um, his ethnographic research has involved learning the local languages, learning to play the local instruments, and interviewing musicians about what they do and what the oral histories of their music are. Um, so I would say he's one of my intellectual inspirations for looking at so he studied mostly musics in India and I've studied mostly musics in Sri Lanka, but I've definitely been inspired by some of his research methods. Um, if you have studied Western musics or Indian classical musics, you will know that many musicians think of rhythms in terms of beats of equal durations. Uh, and even the Natya Shastra provides evidence that certain South Asian musicians have done this in the past for centuries. Um, in contrast, uh, Richard Wolf has observed that across South Asia, there's many other principles for organizing musical rhythms. For example, based on the number of accented drum strokes or in relation to verbal formulas. Um, to begin this talk, I'm going to cite some of Wolf's ethnographic findings and interpretations. Um, so the next, yeah, so this is going to be the most technical part of my talk today. Um, if you want, you can just enjoy the musical examples and take my word for it that they are similar, that they are organized in similar ways. Um, the reason I've decided to keep the technical details is because I do like to show evidence, um, especially when I'm suggesting ideas that might be controversial. For example, suggesting that people who may not like each other today may actually have a lot in common. Um, so I hope you'll bear with me with the technicalities, but otherwise, Hope you enjoy the videos of this diverse diversity of musics. Um, so based on his field research, Wolf has described a few isolated incidents in which rhythmic patterns are not described in terms of equal duration beats, like in Indian classical music, but instead by a number of emphasized stro drum strokes. Um, I'm not going to explain how what's going on here, but I'll just play it for you. Um, so here, this tribal musician S. Raman from the Nilgiri Hills of Tamil Nadu. Um, he describes three drum patterns respectively as, he calls it a one stroke pattern, a two stroke pattern and a three stroke pattern. And he names these patterns based on the number of emphasized strokes at the start of the pattern, instead of the number of beats, which actually are all the same. When I attended secondary school in Sri Lanka, in Colombo, I was taught that the rhythms of upcountry music in Sri Lanka was based on a system of abstract counts, similar to Thala in Indian classical music. However, I later discovered that this system of counting was in fact of recent origin, having been introduced in the 1960s when cultural nationalists in Sri Lanka were trying to establish a national art form that could be described and taught in systematic ways. Um, I read closely the writings of musicologists such as W. B. Makulalu, and I concluded that prior to the 1960s, um, rhythms in Sri Lanka were described not in terms of these abstract beats, but rather in terms of the irregular emphasized strokes. So similar to the examples, example we've seen from South India. Um, to illustrate my point, here is um, Gahaka Vannama, and what I'm suggesting is that traditional musicians wouldn't have counted the number of equal beats, but they would have counted the number of cymbal strokes and defined their rhythm accordingly. So here we have um, what hereditary performers would have described as a three stroke pattern, um, even though the three cymbal strokes are not of the same duration, as you can hear. In 
fact, according to Sri Lankan musicologist C.D.S. Kulathilaka, the durations of these symbol patterns were learnt intuitively by pupils from observing their teachers, and they were actually variable depending on context. And so such flexible elastic rhythms are no longer acceptable within the classical inspired systems of counting abstract beats today. Um, moving on. Um, so what I'm suggesting is that understanding rhythms in South Asia, not just in terms of equal duration counts, but also in terms of emphasized strokes, can give us further insight into some of the rhythms found in classical music in India. Um, for example, Teen Tal in Hindustani music from North India and Triputa Talam from Karnataka music from South India could also be characterized as cycles of three unequal claps, even though that's not how they're usually counted today. Um, so here's an example of Teen Tal from North India, which I will show you where the three claps, the three unequal claps come in. And then here's an example from South Indian Karnatak music. Oops, I should have showed you those. Oops. So anyway, in noting these similarities, we should remember that it is unclear as to how the isolated tribes in the Nilgiri Hills of South India interacted with outsiders in the past. And we should also remember that Indian classical music only became popular in Sri Lanka in the 20th century. However, identifying such shared musical concepts, such as these irregular clapping patterns, in these seemingly disparate musical traditions, suggests that ideas with deep historical roots have been spread and shared across the broader region of South Asia. On the other hand, understanding how other ideas, such as the counting of equal beats, are associated with classicism may inspire us to look out for recurring music, recurring moments in history where elite musicians sought to codify their musical practices and observe how the prestige of these codified ideas allowed them to be reproduced in different settings. My next examples involve sung sequences of abstract mnemonic syllables, or what we might call vocables, um, which likely functioned as prescriptive models for composing new verses. And I'm gonna begin my analysis by examine, examining some syllable templates from South India before drawing on cross-cultural comparison to shed light on historical connections with Sri Lanka and on generative musical techniques that have become obscure over time. Um, from the 8th century onwards, many forms of Tamil poetry in South India have been composed based on syllabic, syllabic models known as sandam, which were transmitted as patterns of vocables. Um, I'll, I'll give you an example in a bit. Um, these, okay, so I'm going to skip through the technical details, um, but just mention that in the 16th and 18th to the 18th century, um, there were compositions of poems in Tamil called Vannam in which alternate stanzas featured assonance and alliterations. These are poetic techniques of rhyme. Um, the concept of sandam is also associated with several genres of South Indian Tamil folk song, in which it refers to a song's melody and uh, metrical structure of the poetry. Um, so anyway, here's an example, a recent example of sandam in Tamil folk song. Um, as analyzed by Richard Wolf, the initial two lines of vocables set up the melodic rhyme and metric patterns that are maintained in some parts of the song. And by vocables, I'm referring to these uh, meaningless or non lexical syllables, tan, tan, ti, nan, etc. And what I'm hoping to show you is how um, the patterns set up by the meaningless syllables are 
replicated in the words. Yes. Oh, see, I'm, what I'm highlighting here is, yeah, I'll just tell you. Um, as pointed out by Richard Wolff, in the verses that come after this instrumental interlude, the Tamil words correspond with the syllabic pattern of the introductory vocables. Um, these correspondence happen particularly in terms of the placement of the long and short syllables, which I've highlighted in pink, and also in the placement of particular vowels and consonants, which I've highlighted in green. Um, this will make more sense when you hear the song. <laughs> So as argued by C.D.S. Kulathilaka, the genre of Sinhala poetry known as Vannama is based on a technique similar to Tamil Sandam. Um, what he suggests is that the phonetical arrangement of Vannama verses is prescribed, is also prescribed by the sequence of introductory vocables um, known in Sinhala as Thanama. Um, as evidence, Kulathilaka shows that although the lyrics to the piece named Saula Vannama are different in every documented historical source, all the versions share a similar placement of nasal consonants in each line of poetry, as I've highlighted in green. Um, this suggests that the title itself refers to a contour of phonemes rather than to any particular text. In other words, what he's suggesting is that the title Saula Vannam um, is not really about a Saula or a rooster, but rather refers to this pattern of vocables based on which new texts could be composed or improvised. And it seems likely that these um, vocable templates were also associated with particular melodies. Uh, Vannama poetry is said to have originated in the royal court of Kandy in Sri Lanka in the 17th century. Um, it's therefore all the more plausible that Singhala Vannamas are related to Tamil Santam based poetry, especially given the documented influx of influential South Indian immigrants to Kandy during this time. In fact, oral tradition attributes the composition of some Singhala Vannamas to a visiting musician from Kerala named Ganita Lankar. In the following recording of a Singhala Vannama, titled Saula Vannama, um, sung by Chandrakanti Shilpadipati, we can observe the extent to which the syllables of the sung verse correspond with the patterns of phonemes modeled in the vocable sequence, as once again I've highlighted in green and pink. Hopefully you can follow this. If not, you can enjoy this singing. In the context of these examples of similarly functioning vocable syllables in South India and in Sri Lanka, um, the evidence for historical migrations from South India and the evidence for a cross-culturally shared process of musical of, and the evidence for a cross-culturally shared musical process serve to support each other. Um, the idea, this idea of shared musical histories, as you know, contrasts with conventional historical narratives that portray upcountry traditions in Sri Lanka as uniquely Sinhalese Buddhist. And it also serves as a caution against the ways in which scholars sometimes link the origins of musical genres to bounded geographic regions and fixed communal identities. <clears throat> I will now highlight some astrological beliefs that have been shared among different cosmological views in both South India and Sri Lanka. Um, I'll also give an example of how this these beliefs have manifested in the Sri Lankan drumming, upcountry drumming vocabulary. 
In the context, some of you might be familiar with this. So, in the context of traditional Sinhalese Buddhist cosmological world worldviews, there is a belief that groupings of three syllables can bring about good and bad consequences. And these groupings are known by the term gana. Um, while these trisyllabic groupings have been described and named in sources as early as the ancient Sanskrit treatise Pingala Sutra, um, probably as mnemonics for constructing poetic meters, um, these early references don't include uh, positive or negative connotations. Um, as far as I know, the idea that these trisyllabic groupings create auspicious or inauspicious effects are linked. Um, sorry. Um, yeah, as far as I know, this idea of good and bad connotations first appears in South Asian sources during medieval times. Um, examples include the 12th century Tantric Buddhist text Tantra Paddhati from Kerala, and the 13th century Sinhala poetic text Siddhat Sagara and Elusandes Lakuna from Sri Lanka, um, the 13th century Sanskrit music text uh, Sangeeta Ratnakara, and several other Sanskrit Prakrit and Telugu texts from the Andhra region from the 14th century onwards. Today in Sri Lanka, such syllabic combinations are most commonly taken into consideration by astrologers uh, when suggesting names for babies and also when composing poetry to be sung for blessing or cursing. So, Seth Kavi and Vas Kavi, respectively. Um, for, so as I've highlighted here, for example, the trisyllabic grouping short, long, long is associated with water and invokes the benevolent influence of the planet Venus while the grouping long, short, long is associated with fire and it influ uh, invokes the malevolent influence of Mars. In the context of poetry for blessing or cursing, so Setkavi or Vaskavi, um, the first trisyllabic cluster is said to affect the person listening to the poem, the second trisyllabic cluster affects the person reciting the poem, and the third trisyllabic cluster affects the poem's author. Many Sinhalese hereditary drummers whom I interviewed told me that their drumming vocabulary was also based on this system of trisyllabic groupings, um, but they were unable to explain to me exactly where in the drumming these groupings were embedded. Um, I did find one example, however, in a treatise from 1966 by the hereditary performer J. E. Sedraman. Um, Sedraman cites the opening of the well-known drumming piece Magulbira. And he claims that, as with Seth Kavi, uh, poetry for blessing, Magul Bera gains its ritual efficacy from the first three clusters of three drum strokes, um, which he says have auspicious connotations when analyzed as long and short drum strokes. Um, he concludes that the first three trisyllabic clusters all invoke auspiciousness, uh, materializing the clusters known as Devagana, uh, linked to the divine, Jalagana, linked to water, and Mahigana, linked to the earth. Um, so, like this, Tariki, Takundan, Kundanjing. That said, although Sederman groups these opening drum syllables into groups of three to, dis to demonstrate the auspicious syllable clusters, um, enculturated listeners are more likely to hear them differently, um, in keeping with the stock motives commonly associated with the drumming. Um, so, most people are going to hear it like Tarikita, Kundang, Kunda, Jingjing. If you don't know what I'm talking about, um, here is um, a video example that I recorded. In other words, what I'm trying to suggest is that performance practice doesn't really draw attention to these trisyllabic clusters of drum strokes. Suggesting that the placement of auspicious rhythmic patterns in the composition may not have been as deliberate as Sederman would have us believe. That said, however, the power of drumming to transform reality is and has been very real for those invested in ritual worldviews. And part of that power is attributed to the idea that the drumming language is embedded with mystically significant trisyllabic clusters. That the precise nature of this embedding is obscure and not necessarily evident to listeners only seems to add to the sacred aura surrounding the art form. It also makes it all the more imperative for ritualists that certain drumming patterns are performed exactly as handed down by tradition. Um, moving on, beyond this type of repertoire, the Sri Lankan upcountry uh, tradition also contains drumming that relates to the rhythms of poetry in a very obvious way. 
Um, these are found particularly in the Buddhist ritual known as Poya Hevisya. Um, the Poya Hevisya involves drumming that of syllabic rhythms. Um, in this ritual performed on a Poya night, full moon night, drumming is described as a Shabda Puja, an offering of sound presented to the Buddha and the deities. Um, here is one such ritual piece named Sugata Thalama, uh, performed using Gatabere drums. Um, in this recording, which I recorded in Urapola, the syllabic rhythm of each line of verse is immediately imitated on the Gatabere drums. So you can hear that here. Let me go play the. <laughs> Before performing this excerpt, the musicians had sung a verse in Singhala, now describing the moment of the Buddha's enlightenment, followed by this verse containing non-lexical drum syllables, as well as foreign words in Sanskrit and Telangu. As you saw in the video, the second verse was then sung one line at a time, alternating with drumming of the same rhythms. Um, in this case, the long syllables are, were played on the drums. But okay, the long syllables in the text are sung for longer durations than the short syllables. I guess that's obvious. Uh, but this produces a pattern of long and short durations which can be replicated on the drums. Um, so as you notice, the majority of the words in this verse were Sanskrit, which is a scriptural language that has historically carried much literary and political prestige. Um, given the adulating nature of these Sanskrit words, and given that the drumming produces an amplified reiteration of this sacred text, I think it's not surprising that the performance of these pieces were considered an act of worship. Uh, in the form of a Shabda Puja, a offering of sound. Um, the inclusion of Telangu words is more difficult to explain. Uh, I speculate that it might be meant to evoke the language spoken by the kings of Kandy in the 18th century, or maybe that of the Andigura mendicants from Andhra who were resident in the Kandyan kingdom of the, at the time. Um, so connections with South Asia. Um, as argued by Ter Ellingson, some Buddhists in 14th century Tibet also played sacred texts on their drums, possibly continuing an older tradition that originated in Buddhist practices in India. Um, and the evidence for this comes from a medieval text. Um, so um, in light of this, I should I think it's worth considering how the drumming of these text patterns in Sinhalese Buddhist rituals might be connected to historical Buddhist practices from across the broader South Asian region. Um, at the same time, we shouldn't be overly reductive, um, attributing this emphasis on verbal sounds purely to Buddhist worldviews um, is to ignore the presence of speech surrogate drumming in South Asian Muslim and Hindu traditions, as well as all the other um, social and aesthetic hierarchies in South Asia that privilege vocality. Um, just as an example um, of something that's not Buddhist and probably not connected to this tradition is from uh, North Indian Hindustani music from North India and Pakistan um, where Pakavaj and Tabla drummers play a piece known as Bol Paran. Um, similar to the Sri Lankan piece Sugata Thalama, a performance of Bol Paran is based on a recited poem about a deity um, this includes Sanskrit as well as drum syllables, which are then imitated on the drum. Um, so I'm not going to draw direct links between this and Sri Lanka, given that um, there are many racist political implications to that. But I'm simply presenting this Bolparan about um, the deity Ganesh, um, simply as an example of how the concept of drummed poetry is shared across the South Asian region. Target it.
I was going to talk a bit about the increase in complexity in terms of drumming in 20th century South Asia. And I think I have time for that. Um, so I'm going to go ahead. Um, so many drumming traditions in South Asia in the 20th century have grown more impressive and have moved beyond their role as background accompaniment. Um, the technical complexity seen in many South Asian drumming traditions today does not seem to have a long history. And yet we can't easily attribute it to changing views about art during the colonial era. Um, so the fact that these developments took place in multiple locations, in multiple genres of music in the 20th century, shows that, I suggest, changing aesthetic preferences can also be shared in keeping with global trends. So here's a recording of a uh, ghazal recorded in Punjab in 1911, um, played in the 14-beat Tala cycle known as Punjabi Damar, um, accompanied by a few sparse drum strokes on the dole. And I wanted to contrast that with, um, here's a recently recorded excerpt from a virtuoso tabla solo playing the same tala of Punjabi Damar. And I hope that the change in aesthetic and, aesthetic and function of the drum during the hundred years that separate these two recordings should be apparent. So here's the same rhythmic cycle interpreted in a much more virtuosic manner. seems that the idea of a tabla solo is relatively recent. Um, a similar increase in complexity can also be seen in the Sri Lankan upcountry tradition as evident in these two recordings of Gajaga Vannama that I'm going to play for you. And this example from recorded around 1977 features a sparse accompaniment of the hourglass drum Udakki. This second example features a recent recording of Gajaga Vannama. Here the drummers are in two groups playing two different drum patterns at the same time, which results in a new drum pattern that is perceived by the listeners. And the drumming here is more foregrounded than in the previous example. So here's a recent Gajaga Vannama. <laughs> Ah! 
So to conclude, um, through my recent, I mean, through my selected examples of music from the Sri Lankan and Indian sub, from Sri Lanka and the Indian subcontinent, I've drawn attention to some of the ways, some of the many ways in music across South Asia can relate to each other. For example, through shared historical roots, shared sources, or shared trends. Uh, in my first example, I pointed out similarities in the counting of rhythms in seemingly disparate musical traditions, suggesting that certain ideas about musical structure have traveled far and wide. And we know from other historical precedents that ideas can, ideas can travel along with the migration of people um, through contact between interacting communities, through conquest, or through the widespread circulation of prestigious texts. Now, in my second example, um, of vocal sequences that serve to model the syllabic patterns of subsequent verses, I drew on documented relationships between South India and Sri Lanka to argue that the Singhala Vannama compositions derived directly from Tamil Sandham. Um, along with my next example that highlighted the cosmological worldviews shared across this region, um, the idea of shared cultural roots um, this contrasts with conventional historical narratives that portray Sri Lankan upcountry traditions as uniquely Sinhalese Buddhist, um, as I mentioned earlier, and it also serves as a caution against the ways with, in which scholars sometimes link musical genres to particular communities and regions in an overly simplistic way. Um, from the standpoint of music analysis, um, understanding nonverbal music in relation to language structures um, allows us new modes of theorizing which don't depend on just counting equal duration beats, um, instead focusing on moving the focus from timing patterns to culturally determined durational categories. Um, in fact, as I've argued elsewhere, um, this search for ideal type timing models can have an unforeseen prescriptive effect. Um, since the 1960s, when upcountry drumming was first theorized in terms of these beats, uh, I suggest that there's been significant changes in the musical structures that are commonly performed on upcountry getabeda drums. It is difficult to disentangle the many factors that have contributed to the changing context for drumming in 20th century South Asia, and which have brought drummers from the ritual floor to the concert stage, from accompanist role to the foreground of musical performance, and have driven them to showcase increasingly complex musical techniques. And however, the fact that similar shifts in musical thinking have taken place throughout South Asia suggest similarities in the ways that South Asians have responded to broader global trends. Um, through my analysis, I have also tried to highlight some of the different ways in which we can study history, for example, through ethnographic research on oral traditions, through trying to understand traditions on their own terms, um, through cross-cultural comparisons, um, well, there's many things, um, by drawing on academic theories to ask new questions about old data, um, through tracing processes of historical continuity and rupture, and through questioning the roots and motivations behind particular conventional historical narratives. Um, if our research leads us to evidence of shared cultural histories, I think that this in turn should make us question the social divisions based on ethnicity, caste, and religion that are often considered essential parts of people's identities today. Um, the last thing I want to say is that the scientific method, method has indeed brought great advances to humanity. However, I do hope that my research can serve as a reminder of how different modes of knowledge can inspire different approaches to living, both in the past and in the present, and also raise the question as to whether there are in fact distinctly South Asian ways of approaching cultural production. Um, that said, I will not insist that seemingly different cultural products are only studied in terms of their own cultural meanings. After all, many people react to arts in contexts which are far removed from their places of origin. Um, rather, I am suggesting that trying to comprehend the variety of ways in which people across time and borders have approached reality will allow a fuller understanding of what makes us human. Um, so that is my presentation today. Thank you for um, listening. I hope I didn't um, bore you with the technical details too much. Um, yeah, thank you. Oh, we should stop sharing. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ashanta, for that beautifully illustrated lecture about shared histories which are relevant to 
various ethnic groups in Sri Lanka. So um, now, if anybody has questions, it's best if you can raise your hand. Otherwise, you can just raise your hand within your picture. But if you can use the raise hand function, that would be good. So it's question time. And uh, we have about one hour for questions. Yes. Okay, so may I just ask a question? Okay, Ruan first. Okay, Shanta, uh, thank you very much. This is a field which I'm not very familiar with. So uh, please pardon my ignorance on this. Uh, so this is going to be a sort of a, you know, part question, which I need to make sure that I'm asking it correctly. So, so let me get this right. So say, um, in, in Western medicine, uh, sorry, in Western music, if we write down the notation and send it by email or, you know, some other means to another person, they can exactly replicate the, the same music, right? So similarly, uh, is there any way of replicating a drum beat as known to the press current either Western or Eastern world? So like, you know, you in, in some way you write down the drum beats and w would it be possible to replicate exactly as it is, like in music? Yeah, okay, so in Western music, um, the current notation system um, allows you to notate uh, pitch and rhythm very accurately. Um, so as you said, you can email it to someone and they will be able to replicate the pitches and rhythms if they don't know the style, it's not going to sound very good. Um, so I think it's essential that, um, yeah, so you need to, you need more information than is already encoded on the page. Um, but yes, you can, you will be able to get the pitch and the rhythm. Um, similarly, um, and this allows you to be able to share this music without actually talking to the other person, assuming that you both know the style. Um, so I would argue that that's the same thing that's happening when, let's say, oral tradition musicians. Um, so their way of notation is to use these drum syllables. Um, so you have a drum pattern that you play with your hands, and then you will have a system of Tarikita Kunda, Jing Jing, Gattat. And if another drummer hears those syllables, they will know how to play that on the drum. So, in, in many ways, that is a form of notation. Um, so, if they were to write down Tarikita Kunda, Jing Jing and send a manuscript or a piece of paper, another drummer would be able to play that because they already know what it's meant to sound like. So, as with the Western music, they have that extra knowledge of the actual tradition. Now, of course, Tarikita Kunda Jin Jin doesn't give an outsider um, any information about what drum strokes to play or how long those drum strokes are. Um, and I think that's a, that's a function of oral tradition. It's not meant to be transmitted through writing. It's meant to be transmitted orally. Um, now, of course, you could write down any of these uh, drum patterns using Western notation which would give you the, all the rhythmic information you need. Um, and then you might have to modify the information in such a way that it's clear which drum stroke you're talking about. Um, so it is possible, uh, but then of course, the other the person reading it would also need to know how to read this new system of drum notation. Um, so I think what this comes down to is the fact that um, Western notation for all its uh, faults and strange quirks is a system that's familiar to many people. Like many people have learned to read Western notation. Therefore, you can assume that if you write it in Western music notation and email it to someone who also knows Western notation, they will be able to figure it out. Whereas if you invent a new system for drum notation and you send it to someone, they're not gonna know how to read it. Yeah, uh, so, I would so, say this is true of any sort of coding system. That, that's correct. Yeah. So I think it's same with, uh, say, musical notation. If you give it to a person who doesn't know how to read music, they would be able to reproduce it, isn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So my question is not that. My question is actually, 
uh, in Western music, is there a way of uh, putting up the uh, drum beat into some sort of a notation? In other words, would the drummer be following some sort of a no note um, and then playing it? Or as far as I'm aware, the drummers doesn't follow uh, a certain note. They just know where to, you know, they just give the beat, isn't it? Am I correct? Yeah, so even in Western notation, it is it is possible to notate uh, music for like a person who plays a rock drum kit. Uh, it is possible to do that and it is done, say, if you go to a Broadway or Western theater, those people playing a drum kit in the pit, they are reading an exactly precisely notated drum pattern. Um, but most drummers in pop bands and rock bands and jazz bands, they are not reading notation. Um, because the notation gets in the way. It's just too much yeah. information uh, and the style of music is such that they don't want to be locked into one particular written thing. They want to be able to improvise freely. Uh, and I think in some ways, I guess what I'm trying to say is that notation has many advantages for reading and many advantages for transmitting a musical tradition, but it also has many limitations in it forces you to do one particular thing. Um, I guess I'm comparing maybe jazz musicians to classical musicians, classical musicians who will play exactly what's written and jazz musicians who will try not to play exactly what's written. Yeah, so, um, so the, uh, just to get my mind clear yeah. about this, uh, so do you mean that, um, say, in Western notation, you can write down a particular pattern and send it to somebody and they can reproduce it exactly? Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. Okay, right. Um, and yeah, like I said, you could reproduce it exactly assuming that you know the style. Even if you don't know the style, you'll be able to approximate it, approximate it fairly well. Um, I would say similarly for any musical tradition, you could create your own notation system and use it. Uh, but then again, you have to question whether that's the desired uh, thing that you want to do. So um, are, are they using the same musical notes, you know, in the four bars, the drummers? Um, so um, let me put it this way. So someone who's playing a rock drum kit in, let's say, a musical theatre production will be using that same stuff that you see piano music written on, yes. Okay. Thank you. Next. Uh, just, Shantar, just to follow on on that point, mm -hmm. um, I've seen... Um, with samba, uh, asymmetric mm -hmm. rhythms being represented by vertical lines, is that the rhythmic pattern is represented by vertical lines? Is that for analytical purposes only? Uh, I haven't been to Brazil. Um, my knowledge of samba is that, again, it would be passed down orally in group learning settings um, and when we see it notated, that is mostly for analytical purposes. Or maybe that's something I should have mentioned earlier. So notation can be really useful for people like me who want to analyze the music, see how it works, that sort of thing, and which is different from writing it down for performers to read. Um, as far as I know, I don't think samba performers in Brazil learn to play their music from notation. All right. Thank you. Think, yeah. Thank you. Lakshmi is next. Lakshmi Pereira. Uh, uh, interesting. Yes, I mean, it's a very high five thing. And I must confess, I didn't understand some of them. Uh, so <laughs> I understood the basics, what we are trying to tell. Uh, about the, you mentioned about the Intal. Isn't it? Mm -hmm. uh, the Intal. The 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 so 16 beats. Mm -hmm. And you said, uh, it is divided into two and three, and you showed in your fingers. Okay. So, uh, how does that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, as you know, the dadindinda, dadindinda, dadindinda. There are sixteen of those pulses. Yeah. Um, so, what that means is nowadays in the textbooks they will describe it as sixteen beats. Um, but you also know that the clapping pattern would be da ding ding da da ding ding da da ding ding da da ding ding da. Yeah. Um, and again, the way it's commonly described nowadays is clap, clap, wave, clap. 
Yeah. Um, so what some people are suggesting is that, well, so if you look at the name Teen Tal, it literally means Teen Tal, so three claps. So what are these three claps that they're talking about? Um, so the argument is that here's the first clap and the second clap includes a wave. So it's actually a long clap. So you've got short clap, long clap, and a short clap. So short, long, short. Um, so some people argue that originally Tintal used to be this pattern of three claps and it's only later that all these smaller drum strokes have been inserted in there. Again, the argument comes from the name itself. This is Tintal three claps. Uh, three claps means that one is silent. Um, uh, so there's so four well, the, beats. There are yeah. four, four beats. If you yeah. count the beat, there are four mm -hmm. beats. Right. And it's not like Deepak, where I have three beats one, two, three, mm -hmm. one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, like false, mm -hmm. false timing. So this is four beats. Exactly. And within the four beats, you said the first two is two and the other three is three. How does that come? Oh, did I say that? Um, maybe I. Uh, Maybe I said that wrong then. Um, what I wanted to say is that so of the four beats, yeah. if you make the third one silent, as you mentioned, so clap, clap, wave, clap, yeah. Um, yeah. you end up with three of unequal duration. So there's yes, yeah. one because short the, one, the one, one long one. Yeah, because the fourth, because the because this one is silent, yeah. you're thinking of this one as a long one. Yeah. And then a short one. So well, I guess what I'm trying to say is that people in the past didn't think of these rhythms in terms of uh, numbers divided up. They taught in terms of structures. So the structure itself is short, long, short, short, long, short. Again, this is not really my argument. It's something that it other is, scholars have also made. Yeah. I'm an example. It is like Foxtrot. In Foxtrot, uh, then okay. you get something like that so mm -hmm. but then when you say teen tal you must you you it, it comes to you the mm -hmm. teen you forget the teen about but it comes to you, it is four beats mm -hmm. four beats so yeah. that i mean in any music or any tal it's mm -hmm. the, the main thing is to have your rhythm as four beats isn't it mm -hmm. rather I than would say, yeah yeah so that, that's the thing now if you say deeper uh, is like three beats then deep mm -hmm. tal is seven beats like that, ektal is like that. So you, the the main thing is to have in your mind the number of beats in a bar, mm -hmm. rather than the silence, isn't it? I mean. Yeah. No, I think I agree with you. I think all Hindustani classical musicians today would be thinking in terms of those numbers. Yes. Um, the argument is that. 200 years ago, they weren't doing that. Okay. Um, again, I wasn't there 200 years ago. I can't say for sure, but this is what some people have suggested. Um, but yeah, thanks for your observation. <laughs> Thank you. Also, uh, what uh, Ruan asked, I, I can't uh, contribute much to that. But you know, in the, in the Western notation, you, you get the time signature, isn't it? That's exactly right. Like the time, time signature gives the, the broad uh, aspect of it and if you want any improvisation you can do within it that's true so so you, you can email the whole manuscript with the time signature and the key signature that's true yes so, so even in uh, uh, eastern asian music you can do that you have those graphs and the lines yeah where yeah, you get so something like that, isn't it? I, I yeah. think so. That is true, yes. Yeah, so you, uh, it is, I think it is the uh, same. Yeah, it's you can easily do that. But again, the argument is that um, historically, um, the way that these graph systems, again, the different people argue about this. Some people say that the graph system was inspired by Western music. And then other people show these ancient manuscripts where there's lines and they say, no, this is an ancient thing. Um, it's not really my field, but um, yeah, people are very, people get very uh, excited about arguing about these things. Okay. Uh, anyway, thank you for something unusual yeah. interesting. Well, thank you. And I'm glad you were able to follow some of it. Thank you. Um, next is Nuan Jayatilaka.
Uh, I'm sorry, I'm in a very quiet, uh, noisy place, actually, in the public. Okay. Uh, I think you guys are hearing me, Shanta. We can hear you. Yeah, lovely. Uh, I'll ask quickly my question. Yeah. Um, it, you know, this, the, the, there is a fact behind this question. That's why I'm wondering. When I was a child, I just want to become like a drummer. You know, that is how I'm from a very far away rural, rural village, like from the Ratnapura, where the Sabaragamu tradition is. So when I try to become a, a tradition, start a traditional drumming and dancing stuff, my, my, my family members were, were against. They said no, because of caste. Yeah. They said it is not belong to our caste. You can't do that. But the funny thing is, my dad, uh, my my gra my grandfather is a they are, they are Vedda, which is converted to the single Buddhist Govigama. So my question is, do you recognize the difference in this? We can call folk music, or like what for now I'm calling folk music, according to this social caste, like any sort of different in your research. Please explain me. Thank you. Yeah, so what my research has suggested, and this ties in with the research that people have done before me on Kandyan dance. So we're looking at the Kohomba Kankaria, for example, if we take, this is true of all the Udrata, Pahatrata and Sabargamo, but if we take just Udrata, so we have this um, cast of um, hereditary ritualists who perform the Kohomba, Kohomba Kankaria ritual. That was their job, only they knew how to do it. Um, and the ability to perform this ritual was essential for the well-being of the entire society. And yet these ritualists were the lowest caste ritualists. Um, so which explains why people of other caste backgrounds would not want to be associated with this drum, with this type of dance, because it's associated with people of a lower, class, a lower caste. Um, in the 1930s and 40s, uh, the same thing happens in India, same thing happens in Sri Lanka. Um, people, the nationalists start to um, become interested in cultural nationalism, looking for some sort of cultural identity that can represent the nation. Where do they find these cultural sources? They go to the villages and they start appropriating these um, ritual, um, let's say art forms associate, yeah, ritual art forms. And they try to, or they successfully convert them into stage art forms. Um, at the same time, the people who are doing this are from upper castes. Um, so by putting it into the schools, um, they are allowing everyone to perform this music. They are making it respectable to perform. Um, on the other hand, the people who are now becoming famous on the stages are people of upper castes who would previously have wanted nothing to do with these art forms. Um, so in some ways, the art form that was previously not respectable is now respectable. It now represents the nation as a national art form. And sadly, the people of the lower castes who had brought this tradition for centuries did not get the same recognition and respectability that the art form itself got. Um, so. To put it simply, the drum, which was previously not respectable, became respectable. Uh, the drummers who were previously not respectable remained not respectable. So that's, that's I think, uh, maybe it's oversimplifying, but that's what I saw when interviewing uh, hereditary drummers of the drumming caste in Kandy. I, I believe this would be true in the Low Country and Samaragamu as well. I hope that answers your question. Oh yeah, thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Anna. It's a very important thing that yeah, I, I didn't bring up much. It's Prasanna Kure next. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, very interesting presentation that was. I would like to ask a uh, of a uh, I mean, uh, of a different aspect. Uh, you mentioned about uh, the Ghana and uh, the benevolent uh, aspect of this as well as the malevolent uh, aspect of this. So I was just wondering, and, and also uh, we know this brand of music is used in uh, uh, for therapeutic uh, purposes as well, say for example in Bali Thuvil. Mm -hmm. uh, so 
I'm uh, just, you know, inquisitive to know about, you know, uh, any research that had been done on this aspect and uh, especially any scientific uh, research that had been um, uh, conducted on this aspect. Would you uh, be able to comment on that? Uh, I would say no, I can't comment on it because I haven't come across anything. Um, I know that in India, there are a lot of people who try to do scientific research onto um, astrology. Um, and there are many published books on the subject. Um, in Sri Lanka, I've only found maybe two or three singular books about astrology. And the astrology books will all try to include some scientific explanation or give some scientific validity to it. Um, I, I haven't read them well enough to uh, be able to explain it to you right now. On the other hand, I don't think the scientific community takes any of this very seriously. Um, as a cultural anthropologist, my perspective is that um, belief systems give us an insight into the way people think, and that's something that should be taken seriously. Um, as far as the scientific basis for astrology, again, like I said, astrologists will put forward arguments, but scientists usually don't take them very seriously. Um, I haven't looked into this personally enough to be able to tell you more about this, unfortunately. Um, you, I have tried doing Google searches on these and in terms, so I mean, there's obviously many aspects of South Asian astrology that are well known. Um, somehow, this Ghana thing is not very well is not talked about much. So I can't really tell you much more than that. So I think the idea is that these long and short durations will resonate with um, particular timing patterns of the planets. Um, but that's a very superficial understanding of what the astrologers say. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. And it's Lalanath De Silva next. As a question. Hi, Ashanta, and hello, everybody. I'm not a regular on your programs, but uh, was interested in uh, this talk because of the research. Um, interest uh, that uh, that Ishanta has uh, you know uh, delved into here so my, uh, I, I have this question Ishanta with regard to um, the, the general uh, uh, theory that you proposed uh, have you come across any, any anything in the bibliography or or in your own research which kind of takes the historical narrative further back, just as much as you know, you had the dramas uh, being uh, their, their art being taken over by the elite and brought to the stage. Is there any evidence to suggest that some of these types of drumming, for example, the Kohomakankaria, some of the Bali Toil kind of drumming, might have had either roots or been influenced by? tribal uh, music which might have existed before that for example from the Vedas. one thing i have noticed just just by watching these ceremonies performed by the Vedas as well as the kohomakankaria some of the elements the cultural elements you know of the lighting of the of of, of the various um, and then the lighting of lamps within a, 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 a woven woven shell of a coconut, you know, put on a tripod, a stick tripod and so on. Things like that seem to be pretty common between these different rituals. Um, and some of the dance movements as well. And so I, I'm curious if you come across that connection either here in Sri Lanka or maybe even in India across South Asia. You'd have to give me a second. I'm just going to plug in my laptop. I'll be back in a minute. <laughs>
while Ashanta is um, getting ready, uh, Lalanat, I'm not quite sure I got the question you asked, but um, isn't it there in Mahavansa that when Vijay came to uh, came to this country, uh, he was hearing some uh, drum beats of a wedding, and then you know, then he asked, "What's that noise?" And then he was told that it's a wedding, etc. So even as as ancient as Vidya's arrival, uh, drum beats were part of our culture. Is, is that uh, your question, or I'm not quite sure? Anyway, now Ashanti is here. He okay. Can <laughs> so okay, my understanding of Lala's question is. Um... So, yeah, what connections are there between the various rituals, the ones that we know, what evidence is there that <clears throat> um, rituals such as Kohamba Kankaria might have tribal roots? Um, so the expert on this topic is uh, the anthropologist Karanath Tobesekar, um, who has observed many of these rituals in details for decades. Um, so his books, especially the Cult of the Goddess Pattini, will show you particular um, ritual aspects that Vedda rituals have in common with the Sinhalese Buddhist rituals. Um, so that's that's one way of looking at it, looking at commonalities in different types of rituals within Sri Lanka. Um, then of course there's a different type of evidence when you examine the Kavi themselves, so the and the <clears throat> the narratives that come behind these rituals. So the Kohomba Kankari ritual Within it is embedded the Vijaya narrative, um, but also a narrative of the Malaya Raja. Um, it's a bit unclear where this Malaya Raja comes from. Is he from South India? Is he from North India? Is he from Hantana within Sri Lanka? Um, there's, there's this Kerala connection that seems to come up all the time. And I think all of us would love to go to Kerala and spend some time comparing. I think all most of the anthropologists we make that one trip to Kerala, have a look and say, oh, there must be something in common here. But none of us actually go and learn Malayalam and spend extended periods of time there. So I don't know if anyone will ever actually do that research. <clears throat> um, it seems very likely that there are connections to Kerala, but what these connections are, um, it's going to be hard to uncover. Um, so I guess you get these two narratives, right? One is that there's these connections with um, tribal rituals. And on the other hand, there'll be these narratives that these are connected with um, royal rituals, which on the surface, it seems like these are two opposites. Um, so we can, we can make um, speculations. Um, but I don't think there's any hard evidence. There's no archaeological evidence. There's no written evidence for any of these things. Um, and I guess in some ways that's what makes this interesting because you can look at the music and then make some speculations and guesses about how things might, what things might have in common. But um, yeah, as far as I know, there is no archaeological evidence for any of these things yeah even ritual objects that we have in museums i don't think they're very old uh, okay, but these are fascinating you. questions and thanks for raising this yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, thank you thank you Sean. Uh, so there are no more questions yet but i just wondered with uh, your experience in sri lanka and the recent network that you're running with for performance arts whether there are any plans for mapping the musical landscape of Sri Lanka, perhaps music and dance, and that would reveal the cultural connections to various parts, not just South Asia, but other parts as well. So including linguistics, for example, one um, was the, the, sounds to me like a Tamil word. So this etymologically, is it was presumably was accepted that that was a Tamil word. But, and then now you are showing the cultural connections. So linguistically, it seems to be established before the musical connections are revealed. Uh, presumably, I haven't heard any linguists talk about this much. Um, usually the argument is whether Varnam came from the Tamil word Varnam. Mm -hmm. um, 
and so that I mean that was the argument, and I think it's it's fairly clear to me that Varnam doesn't come from Varnam. Um, so what happens with that argument is that the people who want to say that it's a purely Sinhalese tradition will say no, it doesn't come from the Tamil Varnam. And then the people who want to say that it's connected will say, yes, it does come from the Tamil word Varnam. Um, whereas what people don't seem to consider is that there's a different Tamil word, Varnam, literally the same word. Uh, maybe it's not such a common word in Tamil. Uh, I'm not sure. Yeah. Uh, so I don't know if it's established within linguistics, but it's it's definitely something that I've only come across uh, CDS Kulatilaka talking about it, and then no one else cites him. No one else talks about it at all, which is why I've sort of decided that I need to promote this view a bit more, if nothing else, to get people talking about it. And even if people disagree with it, at least the, the topic is out in the open. And then the musical map would be a nice idea to map, you know, the Vedas and then these connections to India, Malaysia, Africa, Europe. Yeah, definitely. Uh, mapping out the connections would be a good thing. Uh, how would we do this? I guess academic publications is one way, but then who reads our academic publications? Uh, I guess like a website with a map might be nice. Again, we don't want to fall into the trap of, like I said, putting things and saying, these people have been like this for the last 2000 years. These people have been like this for the last 2000 years. Oh, they have some connection. It's more likely that all these people within the island have been um, mixing for centuries. But yeah, Thank but you. coming up with some sort of website that places these things and draws these connections um, yes. would be nice. Yeah. <laughs> migration and diasporas as well yeah for sure I'd, I'd like to promote these ideas so that when someone eventually does have the timing and funding within our networks it will get done so these are all great ideas here yeah, thanks i know that uh, jim sykes book sort of talks about these connections but he's just sort of setting the stage for future research it's not fleshed out yet uh ruan i think you have a question Thank you. Yes. Uh, Jake, uh, I see there's a question in the chat. Um, Kerala, wasn't that area considered uh, Pandurata? Sinhalese kings sought alliances by marriage. Um, I think you're correct. So what I need to do is I need to go back to the Kohomba Kankaria uh, text and see if that word sounds very familiar to me, so let me... I think he's saying Pandi Rata. Pandi. Pandi. Pandi, Pandi. Pandi and Choda. That's... Uh, oh, okay. Pandi Rata. Okay, right. Uh, well, when, I, when you say, wasn't that area considered... Again, what I would say is that many people would consider it to be this place, and then there'll be other people who say, no, it's that other place. So, uh, these are all interesting conversations because it lets you know how people are thinking. Even if the connection is not real, it lets you know how people are trying to connect themselves, how people are trying to affiliate and align themselves. Um, this is, again, not my area, so I don't know, but thank you. I will look into this, Jack. Uh, Ruan, yes, you were going to say. Yeah, so uh, my question is, uh, you know, this drum drumming has been used by different cultures throughout the world. I don't know how it became so common. Maybe it's, a, it's an easy musical instrument to make, I suppose. Uh, especially in Africa, they use drums to not just as musical instrument, but to communicate, you know, uh, certain ideas of, you know, uh, uh, let's say some enemies are coming on the way. They could Conver convey that message to the next tribe uh, with the drum beat. So is there any evidence or have you read that this kind of thing happened in Sri Lanka as well, using the drums as a communication tool rather than just a musical tool? Um, yes. <clears throat> um, it's very, uh, definitely drumming had function, there were functional drumming. So if you heard Rana Bera, you would know that some sort of war function 
is happening. If you heard Bada Bera, you would know that a prisoner is being tortured and being taken along the road. If you heard um, Magul Bera, I guess you might associate it with some sort of Buddhist event or wedding. Um, so based on the type of drumming you heard, um, you would be able to tell what sort of event. Um, and as um, Jaika points out, yes, drums carry a long distance. So this is the reason that drums can function in this way. Um, do drums in Sri Lanka carry specific texts? Um, I would say yes. I mean, if in the if in the distance, if I imagine myself living in a village and I heard, um, I would know uh, it must be Aurudu. Again, um, there's, there's no reason why I wouldn't know it's Aurudu already, but again, it's sort of inspiring these particular feelings associated with these events. Um, I've, I've read books where people, well, Piyasara um, Shilpadipati, the drummer, he mentions a few phrases and he says, I think he talks about Mahapiritata uh, then Vadin. And he claims that that rhythm is used by Tamatam drummers and people who heard that would have known that's, that is what that means. Um, he doesn't say where he gets that information from. Um, so maybe it was told to him by his uh, ancestors. Um, maybe he concluded that on his own. So um, yes, that is the evidence. I don't know how reliable that evidence is. As in, yeah, um, that's the only one I've heard of where literally one particular phrase is di so directly connected to a drum pattern. Um, it sounds very plausible, um, but at the same time, I don't have, no, no other drummer has been able to give me any specific phrases like that. Um, so yeah, it okay. definitely functions in a more general way of, yes, Ranabera informs you of some sort of war setting and in contrast with, say, Malabera, which will inform you of a funeral. Yeah, with regard and, to... Uh... Ruan's, sorry. Yeah. And Raman Pada, thank you, Lakshmi. Yeah, with regard to Ruan's uh, question, I don't know whether this answers uh, it. Uh, what came to my mind is underbearer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Underbearer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, although, you know, uh, it uh, it's not simply uh, a, a, a particular kind of uh, a rhythm of a beat. Uh, but you know, it's which is uh, also associated with uh, vocal uh, vocal saying. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's uh, what came came to my mind. So uh, whether we could consider underbearer as a mode of uh, communication? Oh yeah, I forgot to mention that. So I think you are right. Um, so. Again, what I don't know is the level of specificity. Um, what I don't know is, is the underbearer just calling you to come and listen to the messenger, give a message, or is the underbearer actually conveying the message itself? Um, this much I do not know yet. Uh, as in, I haven't found a good, I haven't found a clear answer to that yet, but definitely the function of the underbearer is clear. Uh, Definitely the underbearer is, it's connected to message giving. Did the underbearer drumming itself convey the message or not? I don't know, but I think you're onto something. So thanks. Well, in my youth, I can still remember, you know, the underbearer comes to the, you know, the Kadamandia and then he, he makes that noise so that everybody comes there to listen to what he has to say. Uh, so, yes, uh, your, your, the, the latter argument is probably true. And that is used to bring the people rather than convey the message. But then we have different types of better, you know, mala better. Uh, you know, it, it gives that sort of uh, very uh, different feeling, you know, a sorrowful feeling. Then the vadaka bere, yeah, so I don't 
think I have ever heard about the Kimbera. I don't think it's used nowadays, but I'm sure that would be uh, some sort of, you know, giving a message of, you know, um, some sort of uh, a, a person who's being killed now as a compensation for what he's done. So there are various um, uh, types of better which gives some sort of communication as well. Uh, I think it culminated very recently into, I think this is Ramam that I'm talking about, uh, did you did you hear the latest Rabampade, Kapudukak? <laughs> yeah, so exactly that's the same the same thing. Um, there's yeah. so it's not like you can hear someone who doesn't know Kapudukakak is not gonna hear that and think of Kapudukakak. So you need to have that extra knowledge of I know these type of coded phrases and then um, and then when you hear the rhythm you it you associate that with it. Um, yes. and also you actually, the same thing happens in rituals when they're trying to do competitive drumming. Um, but again, first they'll announce the phrase and then show off, here, I'm going to play this phrase. Yeah, but you're exactly right. Thank you. Mm. Yeah. For the people who, who uh, for the people who stay away, actually Kaputukak has become <laughs> kind of a very popular uh, popular theme uh, these days here in Sri Lanka. That's what I Even mean. Actually. I didn't want to mention names. But, yeah. <laughs> yes. It's also it heard the it's become a bit disturbing for people. <laughs> uh, Lalath, I think you had another question. Yes. Yeah, could you tell us a little bit more about, the, I, I agree with you that, you know, you can notate, in Western notation, the, the rhythm um, of a, of a better father, you know, basically you can notate it down and send it across. But I think the way in which the better father is articulated, you know, Gudda, Gudda Jin or whatever the, the particular syllables that are used, actually also conveys the technique to be used on the drums. So a gu is struck differently with your, maybe with your palm, the ta is more with your fingers in a particular way. And, and that, that is traditionally known amongst uh, drummers. Uh, so you, so it, it conveys not just the rhythmic structure, but also uh, the technique to be used or the sound to be got out of the drum, which is not available in Western notation. Uh, I mean, you can do it, but it's, it becomes much more complicated than the straight uh, structure. So that's an interesting, uh, I think an interesting um, difference in the type of uh, oral notation versus uh, written notation as well. For sure. Um, I think, um, yeah, I think for analytical purposes, I've tried to do certain modifications to Western notation, which I can show you later. But again, it's it's useful for analytical purposes. I, I wouldn't say it's going to be useful for a drummer. You know, something interesting that I came across is uh, drummers, Gatabere drummers, who told me that the syllables used to be different and they were much clearer. Um, uh, an example is, uh, uh, one example I was given is, uh, what was it, Buji Bata Bachang, which I was told very accurately gives you Buji Bata Bachang, um, but that when these syllables were being taught in schools, those syllables, when the drum language was starting to be taught in schools, these syllables were considered silly and not respectable. Um, so it became uh, Kunda Gata Gajing, yeah. oh. which, which actually doesn't represent the drum strokes as accurately as Buji Bata Bachan. Oh, well, was there some borrowing then from the Indian um, the drumming traditions? I mean, where, where they were using syllables, was, was some of that borrowed in order to convert what was traditionally used into this more uh, pedagogical <laughs> style of, if I might call it that, of, of conveying drum beats? Uh, probably, uh, again, the, there's one man who did all this. So Piyasara Shilpadipati is sort of, as far as I can, the person who really brought this 
so the the dance came into the schools much earlier but i think the drumming really came into the schools with psr's um, initiative and i think he's sort of the person who codified this for mass education um and and he played tabla he played mridangam he was familiar with all those traditions as well um i wouldn't be surprised if he was drawing on all those when he I, I don't mean to suggest that he created a new language from scratch. I'm, I'm guessing he drew on his own. Um, mm. Kurunag, uh, I, I believe he's from from that Kurunagala tradition. So, uh, on the other hand, the person who told me about the Bujibata Bachang was also from Kurunagala. So, what I suspect is that each family had their own slightly different version of the syllables that they used. Um, but then, when it was being codified for to be taught around the country psr decided no we need one standard set of syllables which everyone's going to learn interesting, interesting. Uh, i i wouldn't be surprised if there is there is some indian influence in the newer syllables um, and then of course the sort of the architect the archetypical syllables of tatchitonang those are definitely connected to india like the mridangam syllables are tatditonang or they are they are those same syllables and those syllables are mentioned in the kavi you find those same syllables in the sanskrit treatises so definitely there's connections there when it comes to the actual drum language um that's where things are a bit less clear thanks thank you uh, yohan jatilaka has a question thanks uh yeah uh again singling on nang and thoda mariak precisely tikak godak මේකට ඕනි බෑග්ග්‍රවුන්ඩ් එක කියන්නත් පුළුවන් මේක කලින් අර අහපු ප්‍රශ්නෙත් එකත් සම්බන්ධයක් තියෙනවා මං ආගෙන් අහන්න හදන ප්‍රශ්න තමයි මේ ෆාම සංස්කෘතිය කියන්නේ ගොවි සංස්කෘතියේ ඇතුලෙන් ආපු ඒ ඒක ඩොමිනේට් කරන් හිටියද කියලා මේ ඩ්‍රමින් සහ ඔයාගේ රිසර්ච් ඒරියාගෙන් හම්බුනාද මේ ගොවි සංස්කෘතිය විසින් මේ මේ කලාපය මේක ඩොමිනේට් කරන් ඉන්නවා හේ හේතුව මම අහන්නේ මම 80ට පස්සේ ඉපදුන කෙනෙක්. එතකොට මම ඩ්‍රමින් සහ මේ සම්ප්‍රදායික මේ මේ මේක දකින්නේ පන්සල සහ එහෙම නැත්නම් මොකක් හරි ආගම බද්ධ කරගත්ත තැනකදී. එක්ක පෙරහර වගේ තැනකදී ගොඩක් පන්සල ඉදි තමයි මේ බෙර දකින්නේ අපි. එතකොට හැබැයි 800 1800 කාලේ වගේදී තමයි සෙසු කුල වලට මහන වෙන්න පුළුවන් අයිති අපේ රටේ හම්බ වුණේ. එතකොට එතකන් ගොවි ගම කට්ටිය විතරයි මහන වුණේ උපසම්පදා වුණේ. එතකොට ගොවි කට්ටියගේ ඒගොල්ලෝ මේක ඩොමිනේට් කරන් ඉන්නවා ඔයාට රිසර්ච් එකෙන් හම්බ වුණාද? ම්ම් You can you can answer in English it's it's okay. උඩරට නර්තනය ගත්තම එහෙම දෙයක් තියෙනවා කියලා චෝදනාවක් තියෙනවා. අ सांप्रदायिक शिल्पी तमाय बेरवा कुले सांप्रदायिक शिल्पी एक एक गोईगम इंटरव्यू करा गोईगम बेरवाद क्यों संबंध में पंसले शांति कर्म पंसले पूजा वाल संबंध वे शिल्पीतमे Yeah, we could say that the in terms of heavy drumming the 
let's say the lower caste ritualists who used to play this music have been pushed aside in favor of the Goigama ritualists who are now maybe dominating the HVC scene. Uh, Gata bera gattama mata heme kak kaurut kiuwe ne Jim Sykes ke pote nang tiyena oya pahatarat nang podda ke heme kak tiyena gila Susan Reed ke pote me heme kak tiyena oya school system me ke School system make usas me teaching positions aranti enne university ki hilla igana gatta usas kule aya thamai. Mulkaale dinang ar sampadai ke silpi in thamai school wal igan nuve. Abey deng oye me paper qualifications tiyan katti ta thamai thana dinne. I think oye paper qualifications ganne a paper qualifications ganne pulang kamat tiyan katti. I think mungkin dah ni Canadian dancing kat sana, mungkin hemat dia kaniwar rentet ya, na, okey, citra seni ke kalai ini dang pinek ak. Berewa dini kat sana, okey, tikak, gatah berewa dini kat sana, nang tikak, amah syarikat dari kecil pinggi, ati, tiennu akilah sama, mat, denu ne. Hevi si wad dini nang, oh, itu mak iya nak. Hari produk ni, kalau kita pergi ke tempat baru nak pergi, nak kita tahu macam apa. Mang ayat, ekatika khoela belua, ekat deng benar seno adanya. Mama interview kara me, udara ata tovil karena silpiek. Eh, aku juga dengan me api warga nangan ne, oya me berawa katiti sama me TV ke interview keran ne. Eh, mudah, eh mudah kian natarang mangi tan ne, awal itu siya kat kaling warga, goi gam, tovil silpi inta tanak tien neti kela. Itu no, orang, eka, eka hari itu orang matu kau agan ne beri ulah, kadde, kadde win mi kilo tu no. Right, thank you. Nishchit uttriya khariyata dinna bae, bae egana ta pudda khita anna, thank you. Oya mandaram pootta pudda aragana kiya vanda saha, me professor ganna tupe sekara ke pudda kar, ea kaast gana liye pudda kar pudda kar aai balu anang, pudda kar ahuwe ekona, me ekta thank you koma. Alright, thank you. Eshanta, can you... Mandaram pootta ne, yeah. Eshanta, can you summarize for the recording in English? So, is he basically saying, about the drumming traditions, whether they are, there is a caste uh, domination of a particular caste called the Govigamas. Mm. So the question is whether the drumming that was previously associated with lower caste has now been completely appropriated by higher castes. Um, it's a complicated question, particularly because uh, the higher you are in caste, the less likely you are to even be aware of your caste. Um, so what this means is that nowadays, theoretically, anyone can play a Gataberia drum in a Perehara. Um, so it's, it's hard to say whether the people of the lower caste who previously owned this music have been disenfranchised as a result. Um, so on one hand, definitely when it comes to Candian dance, which is associated with uh, Candian drumming, um, the dance of the lower caste ritualists was made respectable and promoted and brought to the concert stages by dancers of higher castes. Um, was this was this a good thing or a bad thing for the dance? It was. Under the circumstances, it was probably a good thing for the dance because it allowed the dance to be recreated and republicized. Um, it was probably a bad thing for the ritualists themselves who never got the recognition that the dance itself got. Now, when it comes to the drumming, um, at least when it comes to the Gataberia, um, 
I would say still some of the most recognized drummers are still from the original ritualist casts. Um, I'm not sure whether the Goigama cast or um, people, drummers from the Goigama cast have sort of taken this over yet. Um, there's one ritual that's not coming to my mind at the moment, which is, um, which is which only uses Goigama ritualists. I forget what it is, um, but it's definitely a ritual connected with the Buddhist temple. So I think the closer you get, the closer your affiliation is to the Buddhist temple, um, the higher your caste affiliation seems to a uh, higher caste affiliation seems to matter. Um, so what that means is that when you get um, heavy C drumming, which has the thumb mat thumb and dowel drums used you are going to see um, that this has been monopolized by um, musicians of a higher caste um, i would say that it is a complicated question that i can't or my research hasn't doesn't give a clear answer to yet it's not something that i've looked into well enough um, but it's something that i intend to look into it's very interesting because they are saying that i mean the govigamas are saying it as a, something of a lower caste but something which they want because they want to assume a cultural code so to say but uh, in yeah and the same thing happens in india it's it's the upper caste appropriating cultural products of the lower caste and turning them into national culture um, are they doing this intentionally are they purposely trying to steal it and claim it as their own or do they oh. have genuinely good um, intentions to promote national culture i suspect that it comes from a genuine intention to promote national culture they i don't think they are yeah. purposely yeah. trying to steal from lower caste but what happens is that the people from the lower caste who this was their identity this was their um this was their this was knowledge that only they had this was their livelihood they are getting disenfranchised they have been disenfranchised as a result yes in claiming that identity they are also exposing their roots to south india and and the dance aspect as well that is kind of a new thing brought in from perhaps hinduism into buddhism i mean if music can be accepted as spirit maybe and the sabda puja then dance there is no dance but here it's hard to tell um because the kavi the kavi that you get in these rituals claim that the ritualist castes in sri lanka are descended from brahmins the high caste brahmins who came to sri lanka with sangamitra um so there's there's definitely a narrative that traces back these um, berava ritualists to um, the brahmins of india um is there some truth in there who knows yeah. um, but there's there's definitely a, a the, the the few people who do still identify as ritualists and there's not many of them left most people don't want to be associated with those castes the few people who are proud of their heritage um, will make claims that that suggest that people treat us badly but why do the people treat us badly when we should be respected as these ritualists who keep who maintain order in the universe sort of thing yes. um sriya kulupana yes maybe one suppose. last question sriya sorry sorry, no. sorry yeah I mean, I mean one of the problems is continuation of caste system and it has nothing to do with buddhism and it's such an irony i, I it really <laughs> incenses me when 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 it is sort of related to the temple but um, unfortunately it has continued but it has nothing to do with buddhism caste system yes we are considering the nikayas of the sangha it is also related to i know the... i know it's it's oh, it's it's, it's a paradox, paradox. Really angry. <laughs> so that that shows that in sri lanka mainly the the buddhist essence of buddhism is not spread and not practiced very sad to say it, it is it is oh i just remembered it's the suvisi vivarana ritual that is associated that has mostly a 
Goigama performers in it. Um, so I think I did interview at least one Goigama drummer who was a specialist in the Suvisi Viverana ritual. And what the what the lower caste ritualists think or what they claim is that and they see it as a separation of labor. We are specialists in this type of ritual. They are specialists in this type of ritual. We have memorized thousands of kavi from this ritual. They have memorized thousands of verses from that ritual. Um, but I assume no one's told this to me directly. Um, but I do think that the higher caste ritualists do look down on the lower caste ritualists. To add uh, to that, I recently saw a video clip where at a, a wedding ceremony in a, in a posh hotel in, in, in Ceylon, Sri Lanka, uh, the bride was given a drum and she's playing a, a, a drum uh, during the wedding ceremony itself. So it has no longer those old connotations of past. I think it, it's in a way it's good. That's great to hear. Um, I was reading in Susan Reed's book when she was doing research in the 80s, she was told that you can't even take a drum on the bus. It's like the bus conductor will, like it's just a bad object to be carrying on the bus. So great to hear that the drum is, if not the drummers, at least the drum is being treated better. Now. Ruan, would you like to have nearly come to the end now? Um, Ruan, would yeah. you like to? Yeah, I think we're at two hours and we've had some, I think the questions were more interesting than the things I talked about. So thank you for allowing me to talk about these things. Right, shall we? This is the time when everybody needs to uh, open up the videos and unmute yourself as well. Uh, Ashanta, thank you very much for taking us through your um, specialty and enlightening us with lots of information which we never knew existed even. And uh, once again, thank you for Shihan as well for uh, getting Ashanta to the SLLS. And in our usual manner, we will uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Ashanta. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks all for having me and for listening to what I had to say and for the great questions, which made me think more about these. <laughs>